Hey, I'm Tamara Kandacker, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. So if you're into podcasts, which I assume you are because you're listening to this, you may have heard or at least heard about the New York Times podcast, Caliphate. It came out in 2018 and it was a huge international hit and it won a bunch of awards, including the very prestigious Peabody. It was about the Islamic State and it was centered around a Canadian named Shiroz Chowdhury, who went by Abu Huzaifa al Kanadi. He talked extensively on the record about his time in Syria, and he became the topic of debate in the House of Commons, where the conservatives were demanding to know from the liberal government why he hadn't been arrested. The Honorable Opposition House Leader. Speaker, this individual is speaking freely to the media. The government has got to know where he is. And in fact, last night in the, po- in the podcast, this individual described how he executed individuals by shooting them in the back of the head. He said that the people he was shooting deserved it, and he said, I know I won't be held accountable. He said that at least twice. He said this was- Then a year ago came a shocking development for anyone who'd been following the story. The RCMP arrested Chowdhury, not on charges of terrorism, but for perpetuating a hoax. The allegation was that he made the whole thing up to scare the public. This led to the Times launching a review of the Caliphate podcast and finding ultimately that his story didn't hold up. Chowdhury's case was making its way through the courts and Canada, but last Friday, the Crown dropped the criminal charges against him. So what happened here? We were continually being told that there were people who had traveled abroad um, and that people had returned to Canada. There was some fear there, but there was no prosecution, right? We weren't seeing anything else to kind of help explain or understand what was going on. Leah West is an assistant professor of international affairs, national security law, counterterrorism, cyber operations at Carleton University. She's also a national security lawyer. She's going to walk us through this case and the very real implications of Chowdhury's seemingly made up story. You're listening to The Decibel. Hi, Leah. Thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. So Shiroz Chowdhury, he had been charged with perpetuating a hoax involving the threat of terrorism, and his trial was supposed to start in February, but On Friday, we learned that the Crown was withdrawing the criminal charges against him. So what's your understanding of why the Crown dropped the charge? So he won't proceed to trial on the hoax charges, but um, has essentially admitted that he poses some sort of risk to the public. And in order to mitigate that risk, he'll be subject to weapons prohibitions, counseling requirements, etc. Mm-hmm. So in the, that bigger context, this is a sign that it, I suspect, was going to be a difficult prosecution. And ultimately, um, it may have been one of those where they weren't certain that they would be successful. Just because in this case, a terrorism hoax charge, you actually have to prove a negative, right? You have to prove in this case that he didn't do what he said he did. And sometimes that can be even harder than Mm -hmm. actually proving what someone did. So like, just to clarify, why put him on a peace bond if they're withdrawing the charge? What kind of danger do they still think that he could pose to the public? So it appears from the statement of facts that Chaudhary did believe in ISIS's cause wanted to be a member of ISIS, you know, you could call him a wannabe or a fanboy, but, Mm -hmm. you know, he, he did believe and he glorified what ISIS did, which would be concerning, I think, for anyone, because someone who identifies and sympathizes with the cause of ISIS may be uh, potentially called on um, or could be further radicalized to actually take steps that would be violent. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that's what they're trying to to ensure it does not happen in this case. But identifying that that is somewhat inherently dangerous. Do you think that the charge was correct? And does it seem like it was a hoax in the end? It really does, especially after the New York Times went back and revisited its own reporting. Mm-hmm. Right? Really what we know of what he said he did comes from Chowdhury's own mouth, right? 
We know what he told the New York Times. We also know what he told other media outlets subsequently, which was that he didn't do those things. And it stated in the statement of facts that he told the RCMP as soon as he was asked that he didn't do the violent things that he said he did on the Caliphate podcast and that he had not actually traveled. So now that this is all over, what are your thoughts about the role that the media played in amplifying his story? Well, I think the media did play a key role here, and it's not all that surprising. You had an individual at the height of kind of our paranoia and fascination with ISIS and fear um, coming forward and cavalierly stating that they had committed heinous crimes Mm -hmm. um, to the New York Times. And it's not surprising we were all fascinated by that. And I do think he filled a bit of a void um, or vacuum in Canada because we weren't seeing Canadians being prosecuted for their roles in ISIS. We knew we were continually being told that there were people who had traveled abroad um, and that people had returned to Canada There was some fear there, but there was no prosecution, right? We weren't Mm -hmm. seeing anything else to kind of help explain or understand what was going on. So I'm not at all surprised that, you know, the public and the media feeding the public desire for this information filled that gap. And ultimately, they found someone perfect (laughs) who was very willing to share. Uh, Unfortunately, or fortunately, I, I would think, he just made it all up. Right. And uh, what is the legacy of the way that Caliphate filled this space? You know, you saw opposition leaders kind of point to this podcast and say to the government, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You gave us numbers of 60 to 90 people who've gone and come back. We're seeing no prosecutions. And they hammered the government with this. And At the same time, we were seeing the fall of the actual caliphate in Syria and Iraq, Canadians turning up in camps, women, children, and men um, in Kurdish detention facilities. And as kind of the fervor built back home about, you know, ISIS members walking around, they can't be prosecuted. When there were actual Canadians in detention, the government refused to do anything, took a hard line on repatriating those who were in Kurdish detention. Mm -hmm. And we're still seeing them held in northeastern Syria in these detention camps, I think largely because there is no political will to bring those individuals home because of the type of fervor we saw around the the Chowdhury case. I remember that. So so like basically what happened, it sounds like, is Caliphate got wrapped up with the story about the foreign fighters who were still in detention and in order to make themselves look tough on ISIS members, the Trudeau government was like, we're not going to bring them home. Exactly. Yeah. And unfortunately, the them is mostly children, Mm -hmm. right? There are, by my count, it it varies depending on who you ask. We don't have official numbers for men, less than 20 women and about 25 kids in those camps who have now, some of them been there for almost three years. Mm -hmm. And so you're abandoning Canadian children in terrible, terrible conditions during a pandemic to learn nothing but what ISIS believes and supports. While also like allowing the sort of breeding ground for, you know, potential terrorist threats to just be there. Yeah, exactly. And the security situation is such is that, you know, there's breakouts all the time. There is violence in these camps. Mm-hmm. So as long as there are these individuals are remaining camps, and I'm talking about the adults here, there's a risk that they could slip away. What does the government say about why we haven't repatriated these people? Like, how do they explain that? They say it's too dangerous to go. They say it's too dangerous to send consular officials um, into the region. Now, I've seen no proof of that. Um, there's been former um, global affairs officials who have retired who have said, you know, there's been no evidence of that. 
I myself traveled into the region. Mm -hmm. It's not like you actually have to go far. Most of the repatriations take place right at the border between Syria and Iraq, which is, you know, a heavily trafficked area. Um, And we have actually repatriated one child, an orphan named Amira, that was last year. And there's video of it that the Kurds put out. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the statement from the Canadian government at the time was, thank you so much. We really appreciate all the assistance from the special forces in making us facilitate this. And then when you saw the video of what actually took place, it was a couple of air conditioned SUVs rolled up, people in suits got out, they had tea, signed a few documents, and they got to take a mirror home. So is this at the end of the day, just about political will and not wanting to be seen as like rescuing these people and bringing them back? I think so. And I haven't seen anything that makes me believe otherwise. And I, I'm not saying that there isn't potential danger. But again, we have people in our government agencies who are brave and well-trained and this is their jobs and they did it I mean they did it all over the world when it came to coronavirus very very quickly and so really to me this just seems like absolutely political will because it's not like the Kurds want to keep them they are desperate to have us bring Canadians home they're desperate for all foreign governments to take their citizens home because they're bearing the burden of having to shelter these individuals these individuals who traveled from abroad to their territory, to seize their territory and kill and suppress their citizens. And now we're asking them to please treat them humanely and hang on to them indefinitely for us because we don't want them back. Okay, so the burden right now is on the Kurds to take care of these people. I think there's like 60,000 people in these prisons, right? That's right. So aside from that and taking at least taking the Canadians off their hands and then also the, the potential national security risk we're creating for ourselves by leaving them there. Why do you think is it's important for Canada to investigate and charge these people and, and make them face the Canadian justice system? Like what's our legal obligation? So we actually, um, under a UN Security Council resolution, already committed to doing this. Um, back when ISIS uh, was first emerging, the UN Security Council put, um, put out a resolution that called on all member states to take action to prevent its citizens from traveling abroad to join ISIS, which we failed to do. We were caught significantly flat-footed there. And then um, that same resolution and subsequent resolutions called on governments to take action to bring those who had perpetrated crimes on behalf of ISIS to justice. I mean, yes, we were a part of the coalition that stopped ISIS by, you know, supporting with aviation support. Um, and targeting support and intelligence. ISIS remains alive and well inside those camps. Um, And so we need to continue to see that individuals leave those camps or reintegrated safely into their communities in Canada and around the world, because until then, ISIS is not defeated. So the people who are still overseas, how come they haven't been charged yet? I think there's a few things. Um, For those who... It's unclear how they participated or to the extent that they supported ISIS abroad. Um, The RCMP would probably want to investigate and question those individuals. I'm thinking here mostly the women. And unfortunately, the RCMP has not traveled into Syria to actually speak with any of the individuals who are detained there. And that's despite, you know, Canadians having been um, investigated and interviewed by Uh, The FBI, for example, I know some of the people I spoke to there had already spoken with the U.S. authorities. Um, And in that case, we're not being told it's too dangerous, although sometimes that melds into the answer you're getting. But I think there, the real reason is actually the law. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court in the Omar Cotter case said that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms doesn't apply abroad unless Canada participates in a process that violates Canada's international obligations. And certainly the way that these individuals are being detained abroad does violate um, their international obligations that Canada has around arbitrary detention, the right to due process, habeas corpus, et cetera. Um, And just not to mention that the conditions that they're living in violate human rights. So by simply going over and taking advantage of the fact that these individuals are detained in these camps, 
that would trigger the charter's application abroad Mm -hmm. and would actually trigger a violation of the charter. That leaves any evidence collected through that process liable to be thrown out in court as a remedy. It could also give rise to civil remedies, um, not unlike Omar Cotter, where there was a charter violation found for that reason, and he was ultimately able to sue for multiple millions of dollars. So I think in part to avoid all of that, we haven't sent the RCMP, they haven't been able to investigate a number of these individuals, and therefore they're waiting to bring charges. So this conversation about repatriating fighters and prosecuting them in Canada, it's been going on for a few years, and it feels like the issue's kind of fallen off the radar of the Canadian consciousness. And what do you think it's going to take to move this issue forward? And is there stuff happening behind the scenes that we maybe don't know about? Well, two weeks ago, an application was brought in federal court by a number of the families Um, of those who are detained at camps and uh, children who are detained in camps abroad, um, seeking um, judicial review of the government's inaction to date and calling for the court to order the government to take uh, measures to secure their safety and return. Um, So that's one thing that is moving forward. And, you know, the sad thing is, is that I fear that it's going to take a child dying in these camps before we see Mm -hmm. political will. I really hope that that doesn't happen. I hope that we don't get there. Given how unsafe the conditions are in those camps. Like when I was there, there was a riot. There were tens of armed guards shooting AK-47s into the open air camp where, you know, had been littered with children just minutes before. And the other thing I'll say is that there has been two Canadians who an American citizen has of his own will worked with the Kurdish government to get out of camps. Um, One was a child who was ill. This was Peter Galbraith, who is a a U.S. diplomat who has strong ties in northeastern Syria with the Kurdish authorities. He was able to get that child out on his own. And then the Canadian government facilitated the child's return. Wow. And that child's mother remains an herbal to this day because the Canadian government refuses to provide her with travel documents so she can return home. So she's now stuck in limbo while her child is back in Canada Mm -hmm. um, and she remains stuck in Iraq. And it's worth mentioning, too, that other countries have brought back a lot of people. Yeah. And it's actually it's not typically the Western countries who have done a whole lot. Kazakhstan, Kosovo, for example, uh, Russia, they've um, had major, major repatriation efforts. Uh, Kazakhstan, for example, brought home about 500 people really, really early on Mm -hmm. and had this whole reintegration plan um, set up for them. We have seen the United States repatriate a number of people who that they then prosecuted, um, typically men in that case. They even repatriated a Canadian, or I should not say repatriated, they... uh, brought a Canadian back to the United States so he can face prosecution because the Canadians weren't prosecuting him and he played such a significant role in ISIS. And so there are um, Australians, Germans, um, Dutch, uh, French, they have all made efforts to bring children home. In some cases, the mothers accompanied children because that was in their best interests. And other countries have repatriated men in order to prosecute them. Um, As far as I can tell, we're at the lowest end of the low in terms of actually living up to our commitments here because we've only repatriated a single orphan. Okay, Leah, thank you so much for this conversation. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks again for putting this back on the agenda. All right, that's it for today. I'm Tamara Kandaker. Our producers are Madeline White, Cheryl Sutherland, and Kasia Mihailovich. David Crosby edits the show. Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thank you so much to Leah West. You can find Leah on Twitter at leahwest underscore NSL. If you want to reach us, you can email us at thedustable at globeandmail.com. If you want to reach me, I'm on Twitter at anima underscore TK. If you haven't already, hit that follow button wherever you're listening so you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.